Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, so I was going through the G's and 0.5 G's. So in each step, um, we are adding more features, more components, and, uh, and uh, in 4G, uh, one important thing about 4G is that uh, for in 4G, for the first time, we are trying to integrate different types of networks. So far in um, 1G and 2G and 3G, they were all cellular uh, technologies, cellular networks. We also had other types of networks, wireless networks, such as Wi-Fi and um, WiMAX or Bluetooth or all kinds of wireless technologies other than cellular. So in 4G, for the first time, we uh, the probably the biggest improvement, the biggest movement is to try to combine all these technologies so that we could have an end-to-end -end wireless network starting from inside of your room or office, going to, to the building and going to the metropolitan and going to the city and basically go all the way across the world to or, or even to uh, satellites and basically integrate all these networks and try to have an interoperable network in which different uh, types of wireless technologies work together. So <coughs> this, this is probably the biggest movement. And as I will show you in these presentations, we are still far from reaching that point. However, the, the good news or good thing is that we have already started the movements. For instance, your cell phone so, uh, before, a few years ago, you could only use it for voice. You could only talk. But now you can check your emails. So this is one clear example of the integration. Integration between cellular networks and uh, Wi-Fi networks or data networks. So this is, uh, this is one uh, clear example of uh, network integrations. So hopefully in future we have a lot more integration between uh, other technologies to bringing all these technologies and create a true unified wireless network in, in the future. Who has heard about unified networks? Unified networks, uh, so the first and most clear unified uh, network or unified application is what uh, Cisco has uh, started a few years ago and by, com by combining different applications they came up with the unified application network. Uh, for instance now you can have your email account, your cell phone, your home phone, your uh, text messaging, all of those combined together in a unified application network. We already have that uh, at UNH. Uh, you can go to your email account and check your phone messages from your email <coughs> account. You don't need to dial in to, to get your messages. So that's uh, an example of a uh, unified application. And uh, unified network is what I told you earlier, combining different types of networks to bring about these types of uh, application integration. Okay, I think we are uh, approaching the <laughs> three or five times, so we can start. Do you have any questions before we start? Or you keep all the questions for the end? <laughs> okay, so I, I start with, uh, with the slides, and if there is any question, please raise your hand. I can, uh, I can stop. Uh, you don't have to wait for the end. Uh, like I said, I have, uh, I have, I think, around 60 slides. So what I'll do is I'll try to go a little fast and uh, raise the most important points in each slide. However, again, if you need more clarification, please raise your hand. I will slow down or I will spend more time on each slide. 
So the reason I call this NG is uh, because of what I've been telling you so far. I really like to call it NG rather than 4G. NG is uh, next generation. So we don't really know what is uh, next generation because uh, there are so many things we want to add to the wireless uh, networks or wireless applications and we keep adding. Uh, so uh, NG is, uh, is what comes next basically in each step. So if you're talking about 2G, then your NG will be the 3G. So in this presentation, we'll talk uh, a little bit about 4G scopes and introduction. Then we, I will show you some research areas in 4G and how the 4G progress basically from 1G all the way to what we have now and we, what we are hoping to achieve in future. So what is 4G? Uh, if you go back, uh, we, we will look at a little bit of history in the next few slides. And we look at the network architecture, applications, quality of service, security, all these uh, different uh, concepts that we want to understand in wireless networks and wireless technologies. And we basically want to see if, at what point are we? Are we really 4G or 3.9G or 3.7G? People, we, we haven't even got uh, close to 4G and people are starting to talk about 5G or NG. And uh, if you look at the frequency spectrum for wireless networks, uh, we, we, are we are actually already filling up the entire frequency. So we don't really know if 5G in terms of uh, frequency spectrum is possible or not. However, in terms of application, it is definitely possible because uh, applications, there is no end to application. The more we provide application, the more users want more applications. And uh, most typical users are the teenagers and small kids that they want their gaming, their online gaming. This is probably one of the most important applications that we, we always try to find solution for. So, Let's think about how, how did we come about uh, 4G in only a decade or, or less? Because uh, it's only less than uh, 10 years ago that we started talking about 4G. And before that, all we had was a cell phone that we could use for voice. And only in the last 10 years, all these new improvements and adjustments came. And uh, we have basically... Um, we have basically improved, I could easily say we have improved in the last 10 years more than what we did in the 50 years prior to that in terms of wireless networks and wireless technologies. So the G's uh, are going so fast. Again, uh, it was only about maybe 10 years ago that we had 2G GSM started uh, at that time and we, we move so fast. So if you want to understand what is 4G or what is NG, we have to think about future. Basically, you have to think about what you want from your wireless network or your wireless technologies. If you think about this, then this will give us, uh, this will give us an initial point to start about thinking of the next generation. So always the applications and the the technology comes based on the user requirements. So think about future. What do you want your wireless network to do for you? People are thinking about uh, applications uh, to connect all the home devices together, your kitchen devices to be connected to your wireless network and for you to have access to that from wherever you are in the world. So that's the kind of application we think about for future. Thinking about uh, mission critical applications, uh, things like remote surgery. We want our wireless in future, we, we want to be able to do remote surgery. The, the doctors will be able to do surgery from a distant location. So all kinds of uh, futuristic applications that we, are, we want our wireless network uh, to do. And that 
brings us to a concept called ubiquitous and pervasive computing. Ubiquitous and pervasive computing are the future uh, demands of uh, application. We want to be everywhere at any time and ac have access to all our applications. So if we think more about this and have all these applications and have them available wirelessly anywhere in the world, what, what do we need to do in terms of design, development, and uh, implementation of all these technologies? If you think about it, uh, it's really difficult to, to bring about all these technologies. That's why there is so much research around the world in this area. Probably the most important, uh, most important feature that we want to add to wireless network is uh, to converge all these types of wireless technologies to have a, a truly heterogeneous uh, wireless network where all the technologies, they work together and they help each other to have a complete end-to-end -end wireless uh, capability. So as we see, as we go more here, we'll see that the 4G is still in progress. So one more thing to understand is, uh, to understand future, we have to understand wireless networks versus wireless communications. So far in the last 100 years, we have always had wireless, but we always work with wireless communications. Wireless communication is, uh, is the wireless part of wireless networks, basically. However, that's not the only part. We have a big part of wireless network that is not in the, in the radio frequency. It's in wired part of the infrastructure. So we like to, we like to think about uh, natural progression and enhancements and understand how these uh, enhancements happen in the last four years. We want to understand things like physical layer, MAC layer, network layer, and application layer concepts in, in, network, in wireless networks. So to understand uh, wireless network versus wireless communication, you can look at uh, this diagram. Basically, everything that we have in the air is considered wireless communication, sending the wireless signals over the, over the air. Everything that we have under the blue line here, including all the equipment, all the antenna, all the satellites, all the servers, uh, backbone servers, and all the user equipment. These equipment are all parts of the big wireless network. However, they're wireless communication, it only happens before we reach the first point of contact in any kinds of wireless networks. So just a quick review of all kinds of uh, wireless technologies. In this slide, I'm trying to show you most of the wireless technologies that are available. And then we can see how, how it is possible to integrate or unify some of these technologies. If you like, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, wireless technologies could be divided to several groups. The, you have probably heard wireless LAN quite often, right? So wireless LAN is one type of wireless technologies. We also have satellites, so that one group is satellites. Cellular networks are one uh, group. We have uh, other wireless technologies, such, such as wireless PAN, wireless personal area networks, or others like sensor, wireless sensor networks. So the four major groups are wireless PANs, wireless LANs, wireless MAN for metropolitan area network, and wireless WAN for long range uh, wireless wide area networks. And between those, there are several other groups of uh, wireless technologies. And to make it uh, s simple or easier to see, I have uh, 
divided all these technologies to four major groups. First and most important group are the cellular technologies. Cellular technologies, you are familiar with cellular because you all use cell phones. So the cell phones, they came, um, use of cellular system for cell phones came about around maybe 20 years ago, around 20, 25 years ago. And at that time, it was called 1G. Uh, AMPS technology was uh, the 1G technology where it was only analog. We did not still have uh, digital technology. And then the progression of this line, uh, this line of cellular, they, they moved to 2G with GSM, 3G and 4G. Now we are moving to LTE. You have heard LTE recently. That's the next generation of this line. And then the other line, we have wireless LANs, <coughs> wireless LANs uh, <coughs> such as uh, Wi-Fi or infrared wireless LAN. And then we have others like satellite, Bluetooth, RFID. So all these technologies from different directions, they're moving towards next generation, towards uh, 4G or 5G or whatever you like to call it. And then we have one, group, one other group, ad hoc networks, that have started uh, emerging in the last maybe 10 years or so. Uh, s example of that is things like wireless sensor networks that you might have heard and wireless mesh networks that are also uh, popular in the last few years. So, so this, is, this is a quick uh, review of wireless technologies. And uh, again, uh, a little bit more about uh, background about wireless technologies. So the biggest movements in networking came uh, in two areas. If you want to look at the improvements that have been uh, have happened in the networking technologies, probably the two most important one. First one is when we switch from circuit switching to data switching. Circuit switch or circuit uh, networks is basically when you have two and if you call your friend, uh, there will be a single circuit dedicated to your call. That's why when you use the old phones, uh, you probably never get disconnected because there is always one dedicated circuit for you. This was not efficient. That's why we came up with data network. So packet switching uh, is is the, the other type of switching or networking where we don't dedicate one line end-to-end. -end. We share this line for whoever is using it. And then we have several algorithms and uh, technologies that allow different users to use the same, same connection. So this was probably the biggest movement in, uh, one of the biggest at least movements in networking. So this has, uh, great impacts on wireless technologies because again wireless technology was originally only for voice but now we use it for data and we share the, the network. The issues from the old times to new, the old times for wireless we were, think we were always dealing with issues like noise fading of the signal or interference between two devices that they're, they're working close to each other. These were the, the issues, problems that we used to deal with in wireless communication. Recently, we deal with a lot of new problems. We deal with things like mobility, security. So before, we, we didn't have to uh, deal with this because we did not have the applications that require these this types of uh, technologies. Demands from the old time to new time. Originally, the demands were all users, they always wanted their uh, signal to go faster and to go with, uh, to provide more, more data, basically, more data rates. These were the demands of the old uh, generation of networks. The new generations, we deal with a lot of new demands. Now the users, they want sophisticated applications, uh, such as the ones I told you earlier like real-time applications. People don't want to, uh, when they use their phones, you don't want to wait to, to hear a voice from the other side. Now, this was easy in circuit switching. 
because circuit switching, there was one dedicated line for you, so you never had to wait. But in the new networks, in the data networks, because we are sharing the media, then we, are, we have to wait for our share. Now we have to find out, we have to find algorithms that make these uh, weights faster and faster. So these are the new types of uh, applications that, uh, new types of demands that we have to deal with. So just a quick run through of the G's. We have 1G, the most important thing about 1G was analog uh, signal. It came about the 1970s, around 1980 maybe. The 2G was the digital, the important thing was we added digital signal in 2G versus 1G. The example of that was GSM. Example of 1G is AMPS technology. 3G, the most important uh, movement in 3G was that we added data. What I just told you, data versus circuit switching. So this is the first time that we added that was in 3G. Example of 3G was UMTS. Right before UMTS, we had GPRS. So between GSM and UMTS, we had GPRS. You might have heard that. So that's considered 2.5G. It was not a complete 3G, so we call it 2.5 or 2.7G. And then 4G, 4G is what we are dealing with today. Most important thing about 4G is probably the, all these uh, new applications that uh, we need to, uh, to satisfy the demands and the integration of all these networks. And 5G is something in future that we are only thinking about right now. And the most important thing about 5G at this point is ubiquitous and pervasive computing. Being able to reach all your applications at any time and anywhere. So this will be the, the key point about 5G or future of next, next generation. So let's get down to 4G. 4G what, is, uh, what is 4G, basically? 4G is a network that is based on all IP. So all the, any equipment that belongs to 4G or is a part of 4G should be able to send everything using IP. Again, IP is what I described earlier as data versus circuit or data versus voice. So anything that moves on IP is considered data. So the other important characteristic to be qualified as 4G is you have to be able to deliver gigabit per second with low mobility. That means your wireless device should be able to download at gig one gigabit per second. And with high mobility, when you are driving in your car, the, your wireless device should be able to uh, run, ab uh, to download about 100 megabit per second. And then two important concepts, quality of service and security. So 4G should be able to provide quality of service and security. So what is the minimum requirement to be 4G is, uh, is uh, standardized by ITU. ITU is the International Telecommunication Union, is the body that uh, standardizes all the wireless and telecommunication technologies. The radio section of ITU has made the basic requirement to be considered 4G, 100 megabit per second with high mobility, one gigabit per second with low mobility, scalable bandwidth of up to 40 megahertz, that's the minimum requirement to be 4G, and, uh, and provide, the, uh, provide the applications, the, all the new real-time and non-real-time applications. Two examples of 4G technologies are one is the LTE, and before that it was WiMAX. WiMAX actually started talking about 4G before, before LTE. So 4G is not only these two requirements. If it was this, it would be much easier to deal with. There is a lot, a lot more about 4G. I have just listed a few of them. We have to be able to send high capacity we have to be able to send a high. We have to uh, be able to have high data rate, uh, and we have to be able to send all this data over a long range. We have to be able to 
have technology integration, all IP network, real-time, non-real-time application, things like IP TV. We should be able to send TV using IP, using our uh, devices, and then a lot more. So you can see that 4G is much more complicated than what we might think at the first, first point. So 4G uh, works based on the user demands and service provider demands. User demands are always dealing with high data rate. All the users, they want fast, right? They want speed. They want to, to be able to access the internet and download TV movies in, in a matter of seconds or minutes. Things like security, quality of service, these are user demands. But the service providers, they also have their own demands. They want their network to be, uh, to be very efficient, to, uh, to increase the uh, revenue. So these are also the demands of the service providers. So we as uh, technology developers, we have to be able to provide all these demands from the users and from the service providers. So 4G definitions, uh, there are hundreds of definitions uh, on the internet and in books. I have just summarized it here for you, all these uh, definitions. Basically, 4G is the ability to deliver gigabit per second over wireless on a desktop with quality of service and security over 100 kilometer distance at 100 megabit per second while driving at 200 kilometer per hour. So if we can provide this, then we can claim that we have a true 4G. So you would be driving in your car and you should be able to download at 100 megabit per second. So are we 4G or not yet? So <laughs> the answer is both yes and no. It depends who you are asking. If you ask the market, they say yes, of course, we have this device and it provides 4G for you. But if you really look at the requirements and go back and see what is the minimum requirement of 4G, we are still not there. We are still far from it actually. So a uh, spectrum of 4G, we need the application. We have to be able to provide all these applications. We have the two big areas that qualify as 4G. One is IEEE WiMAX or 802.11.16, and the other one is the 3GPP's LTE. LTE is uh, probably the, faster, the fastest running technology towards 4G. So different areas in 4G, as I said earlier, we have LTE, WiMAX. We also have other wireless networks, such as wireless mesh networks, wireless ad hoc networks. They all want to have a part in 4G basically. We have network integration. Network integration is combining two types of networks as I mentioned earlier such as LTE and wireless LAN, LTE and Wi-Fi or WiMAX and Wi-Fi. We need to do enhancements in physical layer, MAC layer and network and application layer. In each layer of TCP IP we need to provide uh, improvements in order to reach 4G. So in this picture, I, uh, in this slide, I'll sh I'm showing you the movements. Uh, this line shows the years from 99. That's why I told you it's only about 10, 10 or 12 years. It's only about a decade that we started all these movements about uh, new and next generation of wireless technologies. So. We have two major areas. One is the IEEE, the other one is the 3GPP. IEEE is the international uh, organization that provides the, uh, the standardizes the technology, the uh, wireless and a lot of other technologies. 3GPP is the, uh, a section of ITU that provides the same kind of standardization. It's uh, I don't want to, uh, to label them as North American and European. Uh, it's not <laughs> completely correct. Uh, uh, but IEEE is mainly uh, 
based on North American technologies for, for many years. And ITU, although they're both international, but the ITU was from Europe. So you can, you can think about it uh, like that. So they both, I, both IEEE and 3GPP standards, they started around year 2000 with uh, 2G. And then they moved uh, to 2010 and future. So in 99, we had 2G, although it was not complete up until later in 2000 and 2001. And then we went through 3.9G, and now we are working on 4G. So the IEEE version of the Gs, they started with 802.16A. That's the standard uh, technology for WiMAX. And they just keep adding new amendments, uh, A, D, E, I. So they keep adding uh, all those features and make uh, new standard uh, amendments. On the 3GPP, so this was the IEEE side. On the 3GPP side, we had GSM around year 99. And they called it release 99 because it was in year 99. And then they started after 2000, they started with GPRS. Then they went to UMTS. And right here, they actually divided to two sections. 3GPP became 3GPP and 3GPP2. So they divided to two directions. And uh, 3GPP, they continued with UMTS. And now they're working on LTE. 3GPP2, they went to CDMA 2000. So CDMA 2000 is actually very similar to UMTS. But it's just uh, standardized by a different uh, standard body called 3GPP2. So what happened over these years? What happened is in terms of architecture, improvements in terms of architecture, in terms of data rate, range, mobility, applications. So we kept adding features to, to these technologies. So in 2001, 2002, 2004, for instance, let's take one example, the data rate. Around 2001, the technologies in uh, 2G, they, only, they were only capable of sending kilobit per second of uh, data. Then we moved to megabit per second, 10 megabit per second, and now we are talking about sending gigabit per second, right? Gigabit per second uh, is, is actually a lot of data if you think about it. Because uh, you, could have, uh, you could have several textbooks saved on your hard drive, and it, uh, it, it will not still be uh, one, giga, one gigabit. So when we say gigabit per second, that means all this, capac all this uh, data or information, you should be able to send this from point A to point B in one second. So. For instance, if you have a movie, if you have uh, downloaded or bought a movie, that movie is uh, usually around one gig, one gigabyte. Uh, so the ability to send the entire movie in one second using your wireless device. So that's, that's really difficult to do. It's uh, still, uh, still not possible. So. Then we have applications. How did the applications change? We have applications uh, starting from voice. Originally, we only had voice. Then they think about sending text and data. And now thinking about IP TV, having uh, TV on IP. So all these improvements, they happen over the last uh, decade or so towards 4G. So we looked at the, this diagram. So this is a typical network architecture for wireless network. The first part of this network is called the radio network. This is where the user equipment connects to something called a base station. So this is the only part that is really wireless. Beyond this, mostly is wired. So most of the technologies, they have a structure like this, where they have the radio network, they have the access network, and behind they have a core network where all the server activities such as security server, triple A server, uh, quality of service is happening. And then they connect to the internet beyond the core network. So 
let's go quickly through the G's. The one G was the cellular system AMPS. This was the structure of one G, the architecture of the network. You have, we had some base stations and the devices were connecting to base station and then uh, all the base stations were connecting to a component called mobile switching center. And then we had some databases uh, to, to save the, the user data. So how we move from 1G to 2G, again, the most important improvement was adding digital capability, not only analog. And then they divided the network to those uh, components that I show you earlier. So this could be considered uh, access network, uh, sorry, access network here, and this would be the core network. So in 3G, the most important move, the most important component that we added was two components that they deal with data. Because remember, the most important feature of 3G was adding data to voice. So in, three, in 2G, we only have this line that sends voice, and these are the databases. In 3G, this is the voice, this is the 2G, and then we added this line to facilitate the data, basically. This was the most important uh, change in 3G. We add the data. And then in 4G, we... Oh, yeah, please. Uh, IMS yes. stands for... The IMS is the... Uh, the IMS... Uh, I, there are so many abbreviations. <laughs> I just <laughs> confused them myself. The, the IMS is the... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, I, I forgot, but it's, it. no, the IMS is actually the component that adds the application to the core network. It has actually a very important job, and if you look at here, this is the IMS layer. Uh, the IMS is basically the, the layer that adds all the, it's an interface between all the applications and the component of, uh, the network, lower network, like core network. It's inter... Uh, all IP, yes. <laughs> okay, it's the, uh, called the IP multimedia subsystem. Basically, it's the layer that allows this multimedia applications to, to go to the core network. And there are hundreds of other components, and they're all this ab uh, abbreviated in uh, the network, so it's not easy to remember all the abbreviations. But as long as we know what is the component and what is the functionality of this component, that, uh, that should be um, good enough. So the 4G, the important thing about f the architecture is that uh, this two components that we added, we make them more complete and we, we have two gateways to interface with the IMS part on this side and the gateway to, move, to uh, access the user equipment on the, on the radio side of the network. And this is the whole picture, basically the application layer, the IMS layer, and the core network layer. So that was the structure for LTE, actually. So as I mentioned earlier, LTE and WiMAX are the two uh, most important or two contending technologies towards 4G. So this was uh, LTE. And then we have very similar architecture for uh, WiMAX. WiMAX also has a cellular system, just like LTE, and uh, it has the extremely similar architecture in the backbone with LTE, with the, core, with the radio network on the first part, and then the core network, and then the, uh, the access network here, and then the core network which connects to the internet. So this is a quick run through of the architecture of this network, 4G network. So what are the research topics? A lot of research topics, uh, I've listed only a few of them. Important research topics that we deal with uh, are radio resource management. Radio resource management is basically uh, 
dividing the radio resources like bandwidth, channels, uh, between different applications and different users. Quality of service management, uh, wireless integration, network integration. So these are typical areas of research that we work with. So now I just want to give you a few slides about what we do here at UNH in 4G. So we have a wireless research group that uh, uh, has two subsections. In one subsection, we work on 4G technologies. So these are the people in, in our group, uh, the students. So our mandate is basically to do academic uh, research and to, uh, to investigate what's going on in 4G and look at the different areas of 4G. And we are focusing more on quality of service and security in 4G. And we are trying to develop some algorithms to improve the quality of service and security. So current projects, we work on the 4G architecture and applications. We work on 4G quality of service, radio resource management. We work on uh, integration also. We are trying to see what networks are uh, being integrated in, in next generation. OK, so let's quickly take a look at the two areas uh, that we work on, network integration and, uh, and quality of service. So network integration, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, integrating between two types of networks to make two networks work together. And uh, examples of that are like Wi-Fi and WiMAX. We have a combination of Wi-Fi and WiMAX, so we have to make Wi-Fi and WiMAX uh, being able to work together. We have others uh, such as uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, integrating LTE and Wi-Fi. So you see that Wi-Fi is in the middle. It's because uh, Wi-Fi... Uh, by nature, it's, uh, it's uh, somewhere in between wireless PANs and wireless WANs, right? In wireless PANs are very short range wireless networks like Bluetooth. Wireless WAN is very long range and wireless LAN is uh, in between the, these two. So these are the types of integration we do. So why, sh why should we integrate these networks? We have uh, wireless LANs. And we have cellular networks. Uh, why do we want to integrate them? Basically, to be able to use capability of all these networks together. Right? That's, uh, that's the one of the main reasons. The other main reason is we want to have an end-to-end -end wireless network. So we start from our office with a small wireless network. And then we move to wireless LAN inside the building. And then we move to... Uh, wireless WAN outside of the, of the city. So if you compare, uh, the most typical integrations are between LTE, WiMAX, and Wi-Fi. So if you look at the capabilities of these networks, you see, for example, for uh, mobility, you have uh, Wi-Fi has uh, low mobility. It has higher data rate. LTE has very high mobility, lower data rate. So it would be very good, very beneficial to be able to combine these two. If we can combine these two, we can have both high data rate and high mobility, right? Same thing with range or deployment. Uh, so basically, integrating these networks is uh, being able to benefit from all of them. So in one case that we are looking at the uh, uh, integration of cellular network and uh, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is uh, basically the network that you nowadays you can go to coffee shops and connect to your Wi-Fi networks, right? So Wi-Fi connects to an access point and from access point it connects to a network. Cellular network, if you have a cell phone, this is the uh, UMTS architecture that I showed you earlier as a 3G architecture. So UMTS has uh, two lines of uh, work. Remember, the important thing about 3G was we added this line for data, for packet switching. Originally, we only had data, uh, we only had voice. 
in this line. Then in 3G, we added the data line. But you, you know that data, using data, it costs you, right? It costs money, so we don't want to, uh, we want to use Wi-Fi, which is uh, available freely in most places. So we want this uh, red line basically to use the Wi-Fi. And this is what we do. We keep the voice with the, with the green line here between the MSC and GMSC. Instead of using the packet switching, we switch to the Wi-Fi using the wireless device. So that's, what, uh, that's why we would like to have Wi-Fi and uh, UMTS. So when we connect the uh, Wi-Fi to UMTS uh, or Wi-Fi to LTE, what happens is that the access point, the AP for the wireless uh, LAN, it acts like a G uh, GGS, uh, SGSN. Yes. Yes. And Verizon, I think, is one of them, will still charge you as if you were using their equipment. It's sort of like, you know, they short charge a toll for a road they don't belong, that they don't okay. own, but they'll still charge you a toll for using it. Um, I they still charge you for yeah. data, whether, no matter how you get it, even if it has nothing to do with their network. I'm, I'm not aware of this. I, I'm not aware because I'm not even sure if I'm not even sure if they can know if you're connected to the Wi-Fi network because Wi-Fi network when you connect to Wi-Fi network in a coffee shop it's just like connecting to Wi-Fi network at your home. The, the only the yes, the yes, smart. They won't know about your computer, but if you use the smartphone, they may not yes, but I I have never heard. Uh, service providers charging for using Wi-Fi. Okay. I never heard that. Yes? Yes. Yeah, if you are at home, then you have to pay for your Wi-Fi network because you're getting a modem from the service provider. But if you're sitting in a coffee shop or in a shopping mall, then the shopping mall is paying for the Wi-Fi. Yes, so for you it will be free, but the coffee shop is still paying for the Wi-Fi connection. Yes, but when they say data, sometimes people, uh, conf people uh, mix up data and Wi-Fi. So when we say data, Wi-Fi is also data really, but data has been uh, labeled with uh, the 3G data, which is separated from the Wi-Fi. Yes. Uh, Skype is uh, is just the application, really. So all this, uh, they're they're um, they're called uh, peer to peer network. So between two two points. So that's just the application. So all these applications, they are actually uh, they will be used in 4G. This this will be uh, Skype would be one of the most typical because Skype it provides voice over IP. And it is a typical application in 4G. But uh, that's different from the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is the technology. So Wi-Fi, uh, we could use Skype uh, using Wi-Fi. Uh, we could also use Skype using other data networks. Yes. 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 That's that's why I just said you s this application like uh, Skype. Uh, you need a data network. So whether it's a Wi-Fi or if it's a, a 3G uh, uh, data connection. 
So if it's uh, here, so from this line, so what you just mentioned, you can use Skype either using this red line going through the SGSN and GGSN, or you could use Skype and going through your AP from the Wi-Fi. So that's, that's the capabilities that some of these applications don't have. Some of the applications, they only work with Wi-Fi for now, but probably very in near future, they will all have this capability. Yes. No. So like, where would the 4S come into play? The 4S for the, for the iPhone yeah. mobile? No, the 4S, that's why I think uh, the, the, the vendors or the service providers, they, they name their, their product with a 4, so it sounds like 4G. Yeah, yeah so when they say 4S, did, did, they, did they call it 4S? They call it 4S, so that sounds like 4G, really. I think they probably, uh, it's not 4G, no. It's not really 4G. We don't have true 4G yet. It's still in the research stage, basically. So if, you, if they claim that it is 4G, they should be able to provide one gigabit per second download. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're far from that now. Yes. Just to clarify on the iPhone, sure. there's a model number. Yeah. So the first iPhone is the iPhone, and there's the iPhone 2, and there's the iPhone 3. It has nothing to do with how it ranks the next. Yeah, but it sounds very good <laughs> for <laughs> S. <laughs> Almost <laughs> like. The first generation iPhone. Yeah. So they unintentionally pulled it like that. Yeah. Okay, so I have a few more slides. Uh, just what we are doing here, we, we are working, so we are working on quality of service integration in 4G. Uh, this is our, uh, as close as we can get to our research at UNH. So we are working on quality of service and what we are proposing uh, is to be able to have one system such as quality of service system or one security system that could, you, could be used by different technologies. So that's what I call the quality of service integration or quality of service unification. So in, in the first case, we look at the quality of service requirement of WiMAX and LTE. And WiMAX and LTE, in order to provide quality of service, they divide different types of application to different classes of service. Uh, they all call it with different names. WiMAX calls their, their classes of service UGS, RTPS, ERTPS. Uh, so these are the classes of service. Some of them are real time, uh, some of them are real time services, some of them are non-real-time services. For example, if you have voice over IP, it belongs to this class. If you have text, because text is non-real-time, you don't care if the text is uh, reaching the destination right now or after a few seconds. So that's, w that's called non-real-time application. So WiMAX has divided their classes of service to five classes. LTE, they have divided their classes of service to nine classes. Wi-Fi, they also have their own system. Wired quality of service, they have their own system. So what we think uh, is why not make a unified quality of service and then map all these uh, different technologies, classes from these different technologies into our unified uh, solution. So we came up with a system of ourselves. We came up with a system, we call it unified quality of service. And our classes, we have seven classes, we call them unified reserved, unified critical, unified high, medium. And we basically included most of the requirement of all these classes from different technologies. And what we do here is 
in each case, YMAX, LTE, Wi-Fi, HSPA, we map the, their classes to our classes of service. And by doing this, what we can do is we can create one uh, framework for the quality of service that can provide quality of service and any technology that comes we can support and uh, this is the architecture formulas so this is uh, sorry. so no matter what traffic comes here I lost it Okay, here. So we have uh, this. Uh, this is a uh, architecture of the quality of service framework that we use. So before we use this for WiMAX only, but now we want to convert this to a unified solution. And we say it doesn't matter what technology the traffic is coming from. So your voice over IP, your text, your any company that you use, they will send their traffic. Right? And we get the traffic and we treat the traffic with the, with the same framework to separate the traffic and provide quality of service to each of those classes in each of these technologies. So we have, uh, this is one of the areas that we work on. Uh, it's basically integration and application of uh, some kind of application such as quality of service that we could use for for the integration network integrated network so I think that's uh, that's about it